let them alone? This study is going to be about that three-word phrase, let them alone. It appears two times in the King James Bible, and uh, really a convicting thing to me. i um, going to be admitting to some faults in this study, and I'm going to challenge some of you as well. So let's start out here uh, in Matthew chapter 15. As I stated, there are two times, two passages where this phrase, let them alone, appears. And um, very interesting who speaks these two phrases. Uh, the first one is spoken by Jesus. The second one is spoken by a lost man named Gamaliel in Acts chapter 5. We're going to be looking at both different places there. And um, this whole study is going to be dealing with... Um, when you're, when you're discussing things with people that are lost and, um, you know, or very messed up doctrinally in things, uh, there comes a point in time when you don't have to answer them anymore and uh, you just say, you know what, let them alone. And uh, I will tell you right now, I'm very guilty many times of not letting people alone and continuing to fight and stuff like that. And the Bible calls that strife. Matthew chapter 15, beginning in verse 1. Then came to Jesus scribes and Pharisees, which were of Jerusalem, saying, Why do thy tr disciples transgress the tra tradition of the elders? For they wash not their hands when they eat bread. But he answered and said unto them, Why do ye also transgress the commandment of God by your tradition? Hmm. You know, the Roman Catholics out there, they have this thing where they hold their divine traditions above Scripture above what they call sacred scripture, and they think that that's okay. Well, Jesus is condemning it right here. Verse 4, For God commanded, saying, Honor thy father and mother, and, him, and he that curseth father or mother, let him die the death. But ye say, Whosoever shall say to his father or his mother, It is a gift, by whatsoever thou mightest be profited by me, and honor not his father or his mother, he shall be free. Thus have ye made the commandment of God of none effect by your tradition. Hmm. They were basically, without getting into a whole big thing, I talked about this in another study, but they were basically making some kind of a little fraudulent thing there whereby they could basically say that this is a gift and to the father and mother, and then they could basically, you know, I forget how the thing works out, but they could, you know, essentially, you know, get money from it, a kind of, kind of a thing, and um, thereby dishonoring their parents. In other words, they're using their parents to their own gain, you know, pretty disgusting. Verse 7, Ye hypocrites, well did Isaiah prophesy of you, saying, This people draweth nigh unto me with their mouth, and honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. But in vain they do worship me, teaching for doctrines of the commandments of men. You know, I've seen this thing with Catholics um, that I've dealt with over the years, and there are, there are Catholics, in all honesty and sincerity, there are ones that really, truly are um, nice people. They really have a desire to serve God, but then you'll hit these other ones, and you know, they're still lost, you know, you still need to witness to them, but I'm saying then you'll hit these other ones where it's just like they understand, they got the system worked out, and they understand that you can play the game where you can be the most evil, wicked person, reprobate, just profanity, cuss like a sailor, fornicate your brains out, you know, cheat people, lie, steal, whatever you feel like doing. But when you come to church, oh boy, you know, faithful Catholics, give money to the Catholic church and do a good job in confessional and, and all this other stuff. Those are the dangerous ones. Um, I did a you know, study of the uh, book of the spiritual exercises of St. Ignatius de Loyola, the founder of the Jesuit order, and it was exactly that. It was you come to the foot of the cross and you visualize this and you visualize that and everything else. And it was basically the whole thing is about killing your conscience, you know, and you don't need Jesus Christ's death on the cross. You, you make your own sufferings. You, you follow your own path, you know, and things like this. You know, Christ's sufferings on the cross is merely your example that you should live by that. It's not that that pays for your sins. No, you just, you know, kind of mimic that, kind of imitate that. That's why those people are so dangerous, the, the Jesuits and things. Again, I've, I've studied, you know, a lot of their writings. But um, 
It says there uh, in verse 7, Well did Isaiah prophesy of you, saying... Isaiah is your Greek, coming from Greek to English, um, word for Isaiah, which is in the Old Testament, Isaiah would be the Hebrew to the word, you know, the Hebrew translated to English would be Isaiah. Greek translated to English would be Isaiah. Okay? But let's look at this. Okay, whenever you see, again, whenever you see in the New Testament, well did Isaiah prophesy of you saying, or it is written in the book of whatever, is referring back to the Old Testament. So let's go back to the Old Testament and see where this comes from. Go back to Isaiah chapter 29. And uh, we'll see the, the cross reference here, what Jesus Christ is quoting. You uh, read about Jesus Christ, he quotes scripture. He doesn't say, well, I feel that I, I think it might be or whatever else or a better translation would be or well, actually, the original Hebrew, you know, should have been translated as, you know, uh, -uh. he quotes scripture. Isaiah 29, verse 13 through 15. Wherefore, the Lord said, for as much as this people drawed, draw near me with their mouth and with their lips do honor me, but have removed their heart far from me and their fear toward me is taught by the precept of men. Hmm. Therefore, behold, I will proceed to do a marvelous work among this people, even a marvelous work and a wonder. For the wisdom of their wise men shall perish, and the understanding of their prudent men shall be hid. Remember the thing there in verse 14. The uh, wisdom of their wise men shall perish. That's going to be important later. Verse 15. Woe unto them that seek deep to hide their counsel from the Lord, and their works are in the dark. And they say, Who seeth us? And who knoweth us? Oh boy. Um, how many secret societies, secret fraternal organizations and things are there in the Catholic Church? Lots of them. You have all the different knighthoods. The Knights of Malta, the Knights of uh, Columbus. You have the Knights of the Equestrian Order. You have the Knights Templar. You have a lot of those different ones. They're in Catholicism. I and mean, you can't just go and say, hey, I'm going to be such and such. You know, where do I sign up? You know, no, you got to go through all the initiation rituals and all the other stuff. You know, a sister sent me a thing where the they're coming out with this thing. What's it called? Uh, not knighthood or something like this or whatever else. It's and they're coming out HBO. They have this thing about the young pope. Now they're going to come out with a new mini series about the Knights Templar. You know, I'm just going. <laughs> you know, so now Roman Catholic. You know soldiers and things like this and secret societies from the past are now people's superheroes and the pope is this super cool guy in the young pope series just dark twisted disgusting violent things you know and again if you're a roman catholic shouldn't that bother you they're having all these uh these things coming out i mean i i was watching previews the one time and i'm i'm just like more and more the lord's been convicting me about the thing of watching videos i'm just going to tell you right up you know if you're watching a lot of videos it's it's a problem um, and the Lord's been convicting me about that. I'm really going to be cutting back completely, pretty much completely eliminating videos unless it's a brother or sister in Christ that I know of. Um, but pretty much everything else, I'm just like, you know what? It's, it's vexing me. But now that that's another story. But, you know, I was, I was doing research for this young Pope thing. I brought out predictive programming and stuff for this because I think that they're basically showing what the Antichrist is going to be with this young Pope thing. And I watch this one clip, and there's like this nude scene, and this woman's topless. And I'm going, okay, oh, boom, I shut it off. I thought, well, I'm sorry, Lord, I had no idea, you know. Now, if I was a Catholic, and I saw HBO making videos about my holy faith that Jesus Christ founded, and they're putting nude scenes in it and profanity in it, and they're doing all this other stuff, I would probably have a problem with that. But where's the Catholic outcry? They don't. See? Uh, why would that be? Well, probably because it says here, this people draw near me with their mouth and with their lips do honor me, but have removed their heart far from me and their fear toward me is taught by the precept of men. And I'm not just picking on Catholics either, by the way. Uh, pretty much any of the, the bigger denominations does this. You go to church on Sunday, you know, church, and when you're in church, you act a certain way, you know, 
I mean, I've heard of quite a few of the, the Southern Baptist churches down south, and they say that you go outside and there's cigarette butts all around outside, you know. Deacons standing around smoking cigarettes and stuff before the service starts. And thinking, okay, got to go in and do communion now and lead singing. Why don't you do it in the church building? If it's not a problem, why don't you go in there and do it? Mm -hmm. uh, their heart is far from the Lord. They honor Him with their mouth. But then they go out and uh, dishonor Him with their mouth. You know? Go back to Matthew chapter 15. Verses 10 through 13. And he called the multitude and said unto them, Hear and understand, not that which goeth into the mouth defileth a man, but that which cometh out of the mouth, this defileth a man. Then came his disciples and said unto him, Knowest thou, thou that the Pharisees were offended after they heard this saying? But he answered and said, Every plant which my heavenly Father hath not planted shall be rooted up. All right, we're going to talk about that here, you know, in a little greater detail. But I just find it interesting you know, Jesus is saying there, not that which goeth into the mouth to follow the man. What's going on? Well, what were, they, what were they accusing the disciples of back in verse 2? They were accusing them of, of eating, you know, bread without washing their hands. And it doesn't mean that they were, you know, filthy out there working in the fields and they had real dirty hands and they just started eating bread or whatever else. No, it was a ceremonial washing and probably had a very... You know, you really did a sh big show of it and stuff, you know, and, you know, and, and all the stuff. Yeah. And Lord looks at that stuff and just goes, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, watch some of the Catholic rituals and things like that sometime, you know, all the fancy things, you know, they, they come in and they, they carry the Bible around, you know, and they come walking in and all this other stuff and, the, you know, and they put everything down. And Lord looks at that and just says, what a bunch of junk. Bunch of stupid nonsense. But let's look about uh, verse 13 there. Every plant which my heavenly Father hath not planted shall be rooted up. I can do a big study on this subject, but uh, we're just going to cover the verses quickly here. Matthew chapter 13. The parable of the sower. Matthew, Matthew chapter 13, verses 18 through 23. Okay, remember, Lord just talked about a plant being rooted up, but His heavenly Father didn't plant. Hear ye therefore the parable of the sower. When any one heareth the word of, of the kingdom and understandeth it not, then cometh the wicked one and catcheth away that which was sown in his heart. This is he which received seed by the wayside, but he that received the seed into stony places, the same as he that heareth the word and anon with joy receiveth it. Yet hath he no root, in, not root in himself, but dureth for a while. For when tribulation or persecution ariseth because of the word, by and by he is offended. He also that received seed among the thorns is he that heareth the word and the care of the, this world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word and he becometh unfruitful. But he that received seed into the good ground is he that heareth the word and understandeth it, which also beareth fruit and bringeth forth some an hundredfold, some sixty some 30. Now there's debate here, okay? First, the you know, verse 19 and 20 through 21 are two different types of people that are basically, you know, you have the first one there, verse 19, you have lost people that, you know, say they'd be walking along and some guys out preaching, you know, street preaching and they hear it and they just uh, and they and they get they turn up their music on their, you know, headphones or whatever else or they just go and they quickly forget. Okay? They get behind you, you know, you have bumper stickers on your vehicle. They get behind you and they quick pass you or something like that so they can forget it. Um, they see a gospel track someplace and they pick it up not knowing and they oh, oh, they drop it down and they quick go. That's the first group. The second group, he that received the seed into stony places, the same as he that heareth the word and anon with joy receiveth it. Yet he hath not root in himself, but dureth for a while. For when tribulation or persecution ariseth because of the word, by and by he is offended. This is your false convert there, okay? Somebody that uh, is basically into the whole easy believism thing. They get some soul winning crew coming through their neighborhood and they get pressured into praying a prayer and they go, well, I guess I'd like to go to heaven when I die. What do I got to do again? Pray this prayer, repeat after me, and they bow their head and they go through the whole thing. And they're, they're a Christian now and 
then they go out and they get start getting some you know people kicking them not because they're genuinely saved just because they're making a profession okay and they go well, this isn't what i thought after all and they quit they leave it but now the debate the real debate comes in in verse 22 he also that receives seed among the thorns is he that heareth the word and the care of this world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word and he becometh unfruitful. Now, some will say, well, see, I believe that that is a saved man that becomes carnal. Um, and I'm not going to, I can't get into this whole big thing in this study, but I think that there are some scriptures, if you, you know, compare scripture with scripture, that uh, this guy's lost as well. Um, he's another one that, the reason he's not bearing fruit is because he's a corrupt tree. And a corrupt tree cannot bring forth good fruit. Right. And I know, of course, I understand. You know, if you go back up to uh, verse 19, when anyone heareth the word of the kingdom. Okay, so you can make a dispensational thing here. I know. But in terms of instruction and righteousness, well, I shouldn't say instruction and righteousness. But, uh, you know, um, well, kind of instruction and righteousness. You know, you'll see this kind of thing carrying on through any dispensation. Okay, this is something that kind of goes throughout the Bible. Uh, different people that come to the Lord for different reasons, uh, sometimes self-serving reasons or whatever else, but you truly get somebody that's broken, that genuinely gets saved, and they stick with the Lord through thick and thin. And, you know, you say, well, yeah, but see, the third group there, verse 22, it's the carnal Christian, and they just they become unfruitful. Um, so that's just, you know, there, well, like I said, I, I can't get into a whole big study on this right now, but I would say the carnal Christian is one in verse 23 there that only produces 30 in terms of fruit. Uh, your hundredfold well, there would be the perfect will of God Christian. The good will of God Christian would be 60 and the 30 would be the acceptable. Uh, Romans chapter 12 is what I'm talking about there. If you don't know what I'm talking about. So... And you can debate the thing back and forth. But the whole point is, going back to Matthew chapter 15, um, you can turn back there, and you have Jesus saying there, verse 13, But he answered and said, Every plant which my heavenly Father hath not planted shall be rooted up. All right, it's going to be pulled out. Okay, so you have that false convert there. Um, they're not real. And again, what's the context? Jesus is rebuking the Pharisees, and he's saying they're false, they're not real. But now here we go. Verse 14. Let them alone. They be blind leaders of the blind, and if the blind lead the blind, both shall fall into the ditch. You'll see that. Then answered Peter and said unto him, Declare unto us this parable. Good old Peter. And Jesus said, are ye also yet without understanding? Do not ye yet understand that whatsoever entereth in at the mouth goeth into the belly and is cast out into the draught? But those things which proceed out of the mouth come forth from the heart, and they defile the man. For out of the heart proceed evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, blasphemies. These are the things which defile a man, but to eat with unwashed hands defileth not a man. Uh, very, very telling. Um, you can eat junk food, okay, as a Christian, right? You're going to get sick, and you're not going to be doing real great things. You're going to feel rotten, all right? Um, but that's, I mean, that's, and that's bad and everything there, but what's really going to defile you in the Lord's sight, just I'm saying this instruction in righteousness for a Christian, is when you let a cuss word slip out of your mouth and a bunch of lost people hear it. Or when you laugh at a dirty joke that somebody told at work. Or you, when you say something, uh, whatever, uh, and you make a, you know, people use it to, to mock the fact that you're a Christian. Uh, that's bad. And for lost people, um, I've seen, you know, I remember seeing very, very uh, beautiful women in the past, you know, and things like that. I, I remember there was a, this one um, girl I used to work with uh, at Strasburg Railroad. And she was very, very, very pretty. I mean, extremely pretty. She could have been a model or something. I mean, she was very attractive. And I was, a, you know, in my late teens, so, you know, had more hormones than brains back in those days. And I just thought she was just the most beautiful thing in the whole world, you know, just this beautiful creature, you know. 
And uh, I heard her cussing the one time, and it was just like, ugh. you know, even back then, as a lost man, I was I was just kind of not very ladylike. Yeah. And, you know, what she was eating, I didn't even think about that. She could have been eating junk food or whatever else, eating, eating a candy bar or whatever, you know. What's that mean? What came out of her mouth is what defiled her. And it's funny because you have Lot back in uh, was it Second Peter, I think it is, chapter 2, talking about um, how he vexed his righteous soul from day to day with their unlawful deeds. You know, he's around the inhabitants of Sodom and Gomorrah, and he's hearing things, and he's seeing things, and he's just going, ugh, okay, this is really disgusting, vexing his soul. You know, and again, i got to get back on this video thing. Um, be very careful what you're watching on YouTube. I mean, you know, I've seen a steady decline in, you know, videos and things. I mean, I, I one of the, the jobs I do you know, as I research, I research a lot of things. People send me links to videos and, hey, what do you think about this? And what do you think about that? And it shocks me sometimes the amount of profanity that's in videos that you don't even, you know, suspect that it's going to be there. I mean, uh, it's just disgusting. There's been times, you know, I've, I've thought, you know, we'd, uh, I'd like to show my son a funny video of a dog or a cat or something like this. And we'll click on something about funny dog does some trick or something. And and the person cusses or uses God's name in vain. And, I'm, and I shut it off. So that's why I'm just like, you know what? It's just getting so vexing now. I'm just saying I need to just, I need to just be done with that. And I'd like your prayers out there too, by the way, um, because it's a real struggle for me. Uh, I, I just, I'm obsessed with learning, um, with research and things. And, and so I'm always trying to find checking this out and checking that out. And it's just getting to the point where it's, it's been vexing me so badly and I'm just I'm under conviction from the Lord and just I need to get away from this thing but right here verse 14 is the one that really the Lord's been really working on me with this thing let them alone uh, the Pharisees and things people that are are elevating their traditions and things unscriptural traditions above the Bible itself the Lord just got to a point. I mean, he was dealing with these guys. It wasn't that he just never talked to the Pharisees and he just was trying to avoid them because he's got his own little call or something. No, no, no. He's dealing with the Pharisees and he gets to a point where he just says, you know what? Let them alone. Just let them alone. And, you know, we got to get to that point as Christians where we say, you know what? I've witnessed to this relative of mine. I've witnessed to this friend of mine. I've tried to talk to some preacher or whoever. And you know what? It gets to that point where you got to say, you know what? Let them alone. And their followers as well. Look at it. They be blind leaders of the blind. And if the blind lead the blind, both shall fall into the ditch. There are people that want to follow a false leader. Absolutely. Again, I, I get a lot of emails and things from people and they say, Hey, did you ever hear of such and such, this false prophet or whatever? Could you do a thing on that? He's attacking you and, and he's got my family messed up and things or my family's involved in such and such church or how do I speak to him and things like this? Well, brethren, you got to pray about that. Um, there could come a point in time when the Lord's just going to say, you know what? Let them alone. Why? They want to be blind. They're following a teacher blindly. And they want to be blind. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Here's a big part of it. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 12 through 14. Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. The Holy Spirit's going to lead you into the truth. Verse 13, Which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. You know, one of the most amazing things to me is so many times I bring out something and it just it's so crystal clear. It's right there in Scripture. It just It's common sense. You know, some of you write the same thing. You're like, yeah, it's just right there. And you get these people, they're professing Christians, and they're, and they're just going, 
The Bible doesn't teach that. And I'm going, yes, it does. It's right there. And they say, that's your interpretation. And you go, okay, look at the scripture. It says it plainly. You know? I, mean, I had a guy here this, this past week, uh, and he was, he was saying, you know, the rapture issue is not important. It has nothing to do with your salvation. And I said, okay, what about the verse here in, in Romans where it says about now is our salvation nearer than when we believed? Uh, isn't that saying the rapture? It's the completion of our salvation? He said, yeah, but he said it should be, we should make, our life should be about Jesus. I said, okay, um, the rapture is the resurrection, correct? Um, okay, are you aware that Jesus said, I am the resurrection in the book of John? You know? Well, I just don't see it that way. And I'm going, how can you not see this? You know? I mean, there's God's judgment and God's wrath is coming to the earth. And Jesus Christ saved us. He's going to deliver us from that time where God's judging the earth. My judgment happened at Calvary, you see. Jesus dies on the cross and he pays for my sins. I go to heaven when I die. He delivers me from the wrath to come. That doesn't just mean eternity in hell. It means God's judgment upon the earth. And that's the time of Jacob's trouble. I still am just, you know, I've preached so many sermons on the, on the rapture issue. I don't even know how many now. I think it's like over 120, you know, studies on the rapture issue. And there's people, and they still go, you didn't prove anything. You didn't, you, didn't, you didn't show me one thing that would convince me that the rapture is before the time of Jacob's trouble. I'm going, what? And you know what? That's where strife comes in. Because you keep just coming back and coming back and coming back and fighting and fighting and fighting with this person. And it just, it, you're getting stressed out and you're getting all upset and everything else. We need to take the advice of Jesus Christ. Let them alone. Just let them alone. And I'll show you another reason. Look at verse 14. 1 Corinthians 2 for verse 14. But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. You know, one of the funniest things in the world is when an atheist tries to judge someone like me. You know? And they come out and they say, Oh, he believes all this stuff and everything, and we can't find it in these different church councils, and we can't find it in these different writings. You're lost. You're spiritually dead in trespasses and sins. You, can't, you don't have the ability to discern things spiritually. <laughs> you know? I mean, it's right there in the Scriptures. The Holy Spirit's not going to show somebody like that anything. And you know what? It isn't just atheists. Professing atheists. It's also practicing atheists. Uh, which, unfortunately, the vast majority of professing Christianity, they are practicing atheists. Okay? They might not profess to be atheists, but they certainly in practice show that they are atheists. They don't believe that this is a holy book. They believe God is just kind of, well, you know, whatever I kind of feel like making him into and stuff. It's really something. But let's continue. Romans chapter 16. We'll see some more instruction here for the thing of let them alone. Romans chapter 16. This is kind of a neat one to remember because you just say Romans 16, 17 through 18. So 16, 17, 18. Interesting way to remember it. Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which ye have learned and avoid them. You might almost say like, uh, let them alone. Verse 18, For they that are such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly, and by good words and fair speeches deceive the hearts of the simple. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Absolutely. You're to avoid them. show you another one. 1 Timothy chapter 6. You might be familiar with these scriptures, but again, I, I'm not just preaching to you know, seasoned veteran Christians out here. I'm also preaching to Christians that are just recently got saved. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 3 through 5. says here, If any man teach otherwise and consent not to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, like when he said, let them alone, 
and to the doctrine which is according to godliness, he is proud, knowing nothing, but doting about questions and strifes of words, whereof cometh envy, strife, railings, evil surmisings. Hmm. Perverse disputings of men of corrupt minds, and destitute of the truth, supposing that gain as godliness, from such, let them alone, withdraw thyself. You know, I, again, I see this thing, you know, I get this thing and they'll say, you know, Brian Nellinger just, he, he deletes comments. Uh, it's my channel, first and foremost. Um, and if I see somebody spreading heresy, what am I supposed to do? Just, I'm forced to leave it there? I just, in the spirit of fairness and tolerance or whatever, I'm just supposed to let wolves and, and false prophets come in and put profanity in the comments and put all kinds of links to satanic nonsense and whatever. And I'm just supposed to do that? Uh, that's not how it works. <laughs> it's absolutely absurd, these people. I withdraw myself from them. And again, you know, just, I've seen some of you write this in the comments too. It just cracks me up. It's these people, you know, you're a false prophet and stuff. And, and, and some of you have been like, well, then why are you watching? You know, withdraw yourself from me if you don't like what's being preached here. Well, they can't. You know, just weird. So since they're not going to leave, I'm going to force them to leave. Don't have time for people like that. Titus chapter 3, verses 9 through 11. Okay, it says here, avoid, but avoid foolish questions and genealogies and contentions and strivings about the law, for they are unprofitable and vain. A man that is an heretic after the first and second admonition reject, knowing that he that is such is subverted and sinneth, being condemned of himself. I haven't always done that, brethren. I am confessing a fault openly before God and man. I have not always done that. There are times that I get into the thing and I start getting into the strife of it and it's just like, let them alone. Let them alone. Just get away from them. And in my pride, I just want to keep fighting. And some of you do it too. It isn't just a kick Brian festival. It's also a kick yourself festival. I see some of you down in the comments and you just keep going and going and going and going and with these people and I'm going... Stop. I know some of you love the Lord and stuff, so I'm not going to just come in and just, you know, count two comments and then just delete everything from there down. Some of you love the Lord, but brethren, you can't just keep coming back and back and back and back and back. You know, and, and I've, I've had very respectful uh, atheists. I've had respectful Catholics and, and others and things like that that respectfully come in and they say, you know, I don't agree with you. I consider you, quite frankly, to be very heretical in some ways, but I'd like you to answer some questions here. And they're very respectful. And I'm not always respectful in return. I apologize for that. Um, my pride gets the best of me sometimes. Uh, and I'm trying to work on that. I really am. Um, you're not looking at a perfect preacher. Uh, I'm, I'm in the ministry. I, I love the Lord. I love His Word. And I love the body of Christ. And I love you too. If you're, if you're lost, I truly want to see you get saved. I don't want you to become a Denlingerite or something. Please don't do that. <laughs> don't follow me. I want you to get your life straightened out with the Lord and read His Word, the King James Bible. I, that's what I want. That's my desire for you. Um, but there's times it gets to me. I get, you know, I mean, type my name into a Google search sometime and see what you get, you know, okay? Uh, I get attacked quite a bit. And that gets to me sometimes, and I start to get into strife a little bit. I don't let them alone. Confessing a fault to everybody, saved and lost, because it's the truth. I'm going to try to do better. Now we're going to go to the other one, Acts chapter 5. Acts chapter 5, beginning in verse 17. Some very important things here, so we're going to read down to the end of the chapter. Acts chapter 17, or Acts chapter 17. Acts chapter 5, beginning in verse 17. 
Then the high priest rose up, and all they that were with him, which is the sect of the Sadducees, and were filled with indignation, and laid their hands on the apostles, and put them in the common prison. But the angel of the Lord by night opened the prison doors, and brought them forth, and said, Go stand and speak in the temple to the people all the words of this life. What an interesting thought there. I mean, can you can you imagine this in modern day, you know, Christianity? Here you get two, two guys, they get stuck in jail because they're out there preaching and the religious leaders would be like the, the Sadducees that deny the resurrection would be like your religious liberals and things like Episcopalians or some kind of thing like that. And uh, they, you know, get angry because they're preaching out there without their permission and stuff. Put them in jail and the angel of the Lord, which is Jesus Christ, and you can look into that. Paul's on the boat, you know, going to trial and things. And he says about, you know, the, the angel of the Lord appeared to me this night, whose I am and whom I serve, you know. He's talking about Jesus Christ, but again, that's another study. Um, and, then, you know, people say, oh, Denlinger's a heretic because he believes the angel of the Lord is Jesus. Well, well, look it up, okay. It's not my belief. It's what the Bible teaches, all right. Um, but anyways, you know, imagine this with modern Christians. The angel of the Lord shows up and breaks Christians. First, they're, they're in jail, which most Christians would be, oh, you know, Christians went to jail? That's terrible. And then in there, the Lord breaks them out of jail and says, go back and do the thing that got you in trouble in the first place. Now, what? <laughs> mm -hmm. That's what was going on there in the first century. Verse 21, And when they heard that, they entered into the temple early in the morning and taught. But the high priest came, and they that were with him, and called the council together, and all the senate of the children of Israel, and sent to the prison to have them brought. But when the officers came, and found them not in the prison, they returned and told, saying, The prison truly found we shut with all safety, and the keepers standing without before the doors. But when we had opened, we found no man within. <laughs> kind of shocking. Now when the high priest and the captain and the, of the temple and the chief priests heard these things, they doubted of them whether whereunto this would grow. They're, they're getting ready to cover it up, in other words. Verse 25, Then came one and told them, saying, Behold, the man, the men whom ye put in prison are standing in the temple and teaching the people. You've got to love it. Then went the captain with the officers and brought them without violence, for they feared the people, lest they should have been stoned. Hmm. Religious leaders fearing the people. That's right. Still do today. And when they had brought them, they set them before the council, and the high priest asked them, saying, Did not we state, straightly command you that ye should not teach in this name? And behold, ye have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine, and intend to bring this man's blood upon us. It's so amazing. We're going to see this here in just a couple minutes, this thing of Gamaliel. But you will see there's many times that God will speak right through somebody who's lost, just to show his power, just to show that he can take control of anybody and get him to speak. Think about what the guy just said there. And intend to bring this man's blood upon us. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. <laughs> it's like, anybody home, you know? Uh, you're intending to bring this man's blood upon us. He means, you know, you're trying to put, you know, the blame for us killing Jesus and put it on us, which it was their fault. But it's like there's a little hidden meaning there. Yeah, if the blood is there, your sins are washed away. Kind of funny how the Lord uh, worked that one out. Verse 29, Then Peter and the other apostles answered and said, We ought to obey God rather than men. What a statement. The God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom ye slew and hanged on a tree. Well, he should have said, Whom um, some might have unknowingly, whom ye slew. Oh, to have that kind of boldness. We all need that. Verse 31, Him hath God exalted with his right hand to be a prince and a savior, for to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And we are his witnesses of these things, and so is also the Holy Ghost, whom God hath given to them that obey him. And it's not talking about a perpetual life of obedience like a lot of the papists are trying to teach in their little offshoots, some of these street preaching groups and things like this. Um, I get stuff from them, Levi Price's uh, organization and the, the Team Jesus and stuff. You know, it's a perpetual life of obedience and stuff like this. They're papists. That's all they are. Okay? It's talking about obey him in, in the sense of get saved. 
That's what it's talking about there. Verse 33, when they heard that, they were cut to the heart and took counsel to slay them. Cut to the heart. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12, the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. You can cut people to the heart with this book. Verse 34, then stood there up one of the, in the council, a Pharisee named Gamaliel, a doctor of the law, had in reputation among all the people, and commanded to, be, to put the apostles forth a little space. If you study it out, he was Paul's uh, tutor, the apostle Paul. Verse 35, And said unto them, Ye men of Israel, take heed to yourselves what ye intend to do as touching these men. For before these days rose up Thutius, or Thutis, uh, boasting himself to be somebody, to whom a number of men, about four hundred, joined themselves, who was slain, and all as many as obeyed him were scattered and brought to naught. After this man rose up Judas and of Galilee in the days of the taxing, and drew away much people after him. He also perished, and all, even as many as obeyed him, were dispersed. And now I say unto you, refrain from these men and let them alone. For if this work or this counsel be of men, it will come to naught. Did you see it there? Let them alone. We'll get back to that here in a minute. But if it be of God, ye cannot overthrow it, lest happily ye be found even to fight against God. And to him they agreed, and when they had called the apostles and beaten them, they commanded them, they commanded that they should not speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. And they departed from the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. And daily in the temple and in every house, they ceased not to teach and preach Jesus Christ. Daily in the temple, the Jewish temple, and in every house, Christians meeting in their homes. I've heard, I actually heard Baptists try to say, oh, see, they had a temple. They had a temple. I read the context, okay? They're in the temple there, the Jewish temple. But uh, verse 38. And now I say unto you, refrain from these men and let them alone. Isn't that interesting? You have a lost man. I don't, the Bible never records that Gamaliel was ever saved or got saved or anything else. Here you have this lost man. And this is before Paul, by the way, gets saved. You know, Saul, he was Saul at this point in time. And in fact, the very, uh, well, two chapters from there, chapter 7, uh, Saul is there and actually consenting to the death of Stephen, you know, the first Christian martyr. Um, but here you have this lost man, and he basically parrots the Lord Jesus Christ. Let them alone. The only other man in the entire Bible to use the words, that phrase from the, the mouth of Jesus Christ. Let them alone. Again, I have seen this thing. I have seen it in my own life. I have, I've been around lost people sometimes and they will say some statement and you just go, and it just, you know, they're just quoted, they just quoted scripture. They just said something that's extremely profound. What does that prove? That proves that all men are saved and all have God and we're all on our own path. No, it doesn't prove anything of the kind. It proves that God is in control and we need to remember that. God can take anybody out there in this whole world and he can say, speak. And they'll say something. They don't even know what they're saying. But I've seen that. But again, think of the advice here. Refrain from these men and let them alone. For if this counsel or this work be of men, it will come to naught. You know, we get so worked up about some of the false prophets and false ministries and everything else out there. But brethren, it's going to come to naught. If it's of men, it will come to naught. Verse 39, But if it be of God, ye cannot overthrow it, lest happily ye be found even to fight against God. Um, Lord will work it out. And uh, like I said, I've been, I've been real guilty. I mean, I will continue. I will always... Uh, be willing to rebuke false prophets and to expose what they do and things. But uh, I've gone too far sometimes with it and have strayed into the thing of just starting to meddle and, and things. I'm going to give you a real good scripture on this at the end of this study. Uh, and I'm saying I'm, I'm apologizing. Uh, I'm sorry about that. There's times I need to just, just say, you know what? I've done my part. I've preached the word. I've given... 
you know, the scriptures to refute what this false prophet is saying. And you know what? I need to just let them alone. And if their work and their counsel is of men, it's going to come to naught. But if for some reason it's of God and I'm the one that needs to change, then I'm not going to be able to overthrow them. And the Lord's eventually going to show it to me. God will work things out. I've seen that. Proverbs chapter 24. We're going to end here. Go back to your Old Testament. Proverbs chapter 24. You got some kind of a spiritual adversary that you really want to... You really wish that they would just have their mouth shut up because <laughs> they're really doing damage. Here's something that I read a while back and it really convicted me. I'm trying to think of how to work this into a sermon, so here we go. Proverbs 24, verse 17 and 18. Rejoice not when thine enemy falleth, and let not thine heart be glad when he stumbleth, lest the Lord see it, and it displease him. And look at this last part. And he turn away his wrath from him. Isn't that interesting? The Lord is going to work things out. Expose false prophets. Come out and say, hey, so-and-so is preaching this or teaching that or whatever else. And they're wrong. And show from the Bible why they're wrong. But don't you dare start looking into their personal life and start going after things and, and whatever else and saying, hey, you know what? And as soon as you see him fall, you go, ha, look at that, look at that. Oh, look, look. You know why? He turned away his wrath from him. The Lord's got it all figured out, brethren. If the work or the counsel be of men, it will come to naught. Why is it going to come to naught? Because God's going to stop them. God's going to stop their mouth. Unless we interfere and try to take the glory from the Lord. And come out and say, look at me. I exposed him. I exposed him. It was this ministry that first brought out the stuff on so and so. And I got him. And I was... It. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of times, you know, maybe I've gone a little bit too far in exposing some people. And as a result, the Lord just kind of held back some of that judgment that He is going to bring on them. And I need to just shut my mouth and say, you know what? They're blind. Stephen Anderson and his followers, they're blind. He's a blind leader of the blind. They want to go into the time of Jacob's trouble? Okay. Go ahead. You know? Some other guy coming out and things like this. And I mean, I could go down through a whole list of false prophets and things like that. But you know what? Let them alone. You want to do your thing? Go ahead. Lord will take care of it. And I need to just kind of step off to the side and say, Okay, Lord, I mean, you wanted me to expose this thing and, and things like that. I'll get people. And, you know, some of you are really are frustrated. And you say, Brother Brian, I, I just don't have the training in Scripture or whatever else to debunk what this guy's saying. I just feel he's wrong, but I, I don't know. I'm going to go after the guy. I'm not going to say, I can't say anything negative about anybody. I'm going to come after certain groups and certain individuals. And there are people, you know, I, I said years and years ago, I'm not going to make any more videos on Stephen Anderson. Well, he continues to bring out more and more heretical stuff. And I have to say something to try and keep distant from the guy enough that people aren't going to associate me with him. You know, I don't think that there's any confusion now that we're very much at odds. But uh, Lord's going to take care of him. Lord's going to take care of that whole situation. Um, makes me angry. When I hear people saying that Jesus had to burn in hell uh, to pay for my sins and things like that, and you don't have, there's no repentance associated with salvation, and the Jews are somehow wicked and horrible, and God's totally done with them, and it's the church is now the Jews. But then when the New Testament, when the Pauline Epistles attacks, says that the wrath has come upon them to the uttermost, well, that's, that's talking about the actual Jews. It's, you know, I, I, it always cracks me up, you know. The Jews are done away with until the New Testament rebukes the Jews and then they're back on the scene again. But uh, 
just a convicting message uh, for me. Um, just something the Lord's been dealing with me um, for a while now. And, and just uh, my wife and I were talking about this today, and she said, you know, back years ago you used to do a lot more in-depth studies. And, uh, and I need to get back to that. Um, I'm, I am who I am. You know, I, I'm going to be sarcastic occasionally and, and I'm, I'm going to be offensive to certain groups of people and whatever else, but, uh, you know, that's not going to change. I mean, I, Lord showed me a lot and, and, and things and there's things that really make me angry and I'm going to talk about it, but, uh, I want to go back to a lot of the more, um, detailed type of study types of things like that. And, um, you know, hopefully, you know, be doing more videos and things. So, um, that's going to be it. Let's, let's close with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I do thank you for this tremendous challenge from your word, not because it came from my mouth or anything, Lord, but because your word speaks it. And, uh, there's many times, Lord, I have not let, uh, let them alone, as you said. And, um, I just pray, Lord, that you give me the strength to, to, uh, turn away from the strife and, and the arguing and things and stay focused on the ministry that you've given to me. And I pray, Lord, for anybody out there uh, that's going through the same things with family members or co-workers or relatives or whatever, I just pray, Lord, that they would learn when it's time to let them alone and um, not to argue anymore. And I just uh, I pray that you would help us all with that, Lord. I ask it all in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Okay, that's going to be it. Um, not going to go into a whole lot of details or anything, but uh, just a little ministry update. You know, we're, it's uh, November 18th, I think, today. And, uh, you know, we're getting some snow, so I'm trying uh, very, very much. It's evening right now. It's uh, 8 o'clock right now, so trying very hard to uh, get things done before we get much snow, too much snow. Uh, we have a little bit on at the property and things, but um, so, you know, and I just want to say this, and that is that uh, there are preachers that get themselves in debt and they have mortgages and things like that. And uh, so they have to work harder to try and pay that mortgage off. Well, I'm kind of the opposite in that we have no debt. Um, but then my working harder comes from, okay, because we have no debt now, I'm not going to be able to borrow money. So everything that we need to do, I'm having to do it, you know, pretty much myself and, uh, building and stuff like that. So, um, we really do appreciate those who donate to the ministry and, uh, we really do continue to need prayer and things, um, you know, I'm not going to be talking a whole lot about it. I mean, the Lord's been real good to us. Uh, we just we're very, very happy with the land that he gave us. And there's no more issues with bad neighbors and things. And uh, so it's just, a, you know, I really feel convicted that, uh, you know, because of a lot of our problems, I haven't I've been working a lot of other things and not really dedicating as much time to the ministry. And I've had correspondence that I needed to take care of, and I just haven't been able to. Uh, so, you know, we're going to be doing some things here, you know, tying up some loose ends and things with the property. Uh, and Lord willing, going to be able to do a lot more studies, more videos in the future. So, uh, but brethren, I, I really just feel, feel convicted about the thing of, watching a lot of videos on YouTube and maybe some of you just that's not a problem you just come here and you watch me and a few other videos or whatever else and that's great praise the Lord for that but be very careful um, I remember a brother years and years ago he played a little children's Sunday school song you know oh be careful little eyes what you see Oh, be careful, little eyes, what you see, for your father up above is looking down in love. Oh, be careful, little eyes, what you see, you know, that's be careful, little ears, what you hear and stuff. Um, that's actually pretty profound. Uh, there's a lot of junk on YouTube 
And I'll tell you what, it's like a landmine. I mean, it's, or you know, minefield, I should say. Landmines all through the minefield. I mean, there's times you'll click on some video just innocently thinking, hey, that looks interesting. And boom, profanity or some other kind of wicked thing. And you just, oh, you know. And the bad thing is, the more that you do, the more it desensitizes you. You know, and I got to be real careful because, you know, I, I research. I do a lot of research and I watch a lot of false prophet videos and a lot of things like that. And you know what? It's just it's it's getting to me. And the Lord's really been convicting me and just saying, hey, you know what? Let them alone. So that's why I did this study. Uh, just I did it for myself, actually, to convict myself. You know, if I'm if I'm preaching it, then I can't say, oh, well, I never knew, you know. <laughs> Uh, I just got done preaching this thing to you, so the Lord's going to hold me extra accountable for this. Um, if I'm going to be a hypocrite in the future, the Lord's going to give me some real good chastening. Um, but I've also preached it for you out there. Uh, be very careful what you're looking at and what you're listening to. Uh, there's a lot of really filthy stuff, and yes, it will affect you. You can't just make a steady diet of profanity and people using God's name in vain and and other things like that. You can't make a steady diet of that. It'll start to mess up your head. And to mess up your walk with the Lord. So. That's going to be it for this study. Um, got some more stuff planned for the future. Some more redoing of old uh, sermons. I got two chapters left in Revelation. Revelation 21 and 22. We'll be getting to that before real long. Lord willing. And uh, so please do keep us in your prayers. And. Uh, Thank you very much for watching.